Hi everyone, so we are back for part two of the gunpowder plot. So hopefully most of you have seen part one, which is basically where we talked about the bones of what happened, where it came from, all the sort of things that happened in the middle that really should have made everybody go, this is a bad idea, because it turned out to be a bad idea, and then they're all dead. So spoiler alert, <laughs> <laughs> they all ended up dead. And, and the people that were supposed to end up dead didn't end up dead, and it worked out very well for the Protestants and the Stuarts, and not so well for the Catholics. So if you want to know about that and you've missed it, go back and watch part one. But the reason we've divided this into two parts is just because there is so much backstory and so many interrelationships regarding the people that were these 13 gunpowder plotters originally. And to understand really how a lot of it came about is to look at a little bit more of this backstory. And this is where Mike comes in because he has those extra levels of knowledge on a topic that's a little bit outside the Wars of the Roses Tudoring period that I have a bit more knowledge on. So I've come in with my sort of basic understanding and just been blown away by all this extra information. So for the best part, Mike really is going to be leading this session and I'm just going to come in with all the random thoughts that pop into my head quite frequently in my whole life, actually as you probably will notice. So, Mike, John Catesby, John Catesby, Robert Catesby, who's John Robert Catesby? Catesby. <laughs> Robert Catesby, who originally... He's actually his father. Ah, there you go then. I was part of the way there. Yeah. Random. Um, is, is kind of the guy that instigates this plot originally. So, really, in terms of backstory, who is this guy and why has he got this real thing about he has to un undergo some spectacular event? Because as you pointed out to us in the last video, there were many situations where he or an acquaintance of his could have just gone and like stabbed the king and then rode off. Yeah. Um, well, really, um, to give you some idea of his personality and family, we mustn't forget that his great great grandfather was William Catesby, who was Richard III's best friend. Wow. So there is, you can see that direct connection yeah. um, of, of where it comes from uh, and the family connection. That's amazing. Which gives you an idea of his personality because it sort of carries through. <laughs> it carries through, yes. Um, a nice way of putting it. Yeah. Um, and of course, against all this background, we've got all the anti-Catholic stuff that's going on against Elizabeth. So it's not even out of that time. And we start to see, I suppose, that the plots against Elizabeth, and we start to see these family connections starting to, to evolve. Um, you'll put up the little family tree to show people. Yeah. So you can see how all these people are, are all related. And they're quite closely related as well. They're, you, you have these different names and people think that they're just totally random separated people but they're most of them all family uh, and they would have been interrelating with each other the whole of the time uh, I mean one of, one of the the important plots from Elizabeth times the Throckmorton plot mm. um, now Nicholas Throckmorton was part of the family of Catesby comes from Wow. It, he's he's connected with with those um babington plot not so much but there are a couple in there that who might have been reasonably connected um but then you start to get, get on towards the end and you start to get things like the, the recusancy act um and the other issues against the priests and the the act of restraining recusants and all those in in 1593 you also get Robert Cecil into the mix, which we mustn't forget as well. He's actually a Northampton chap. And all of these people, um, although they were they were Catholics against Protestants, they're all going to each other's houses for tea. And they're, they're, they're all that close to each other. And they're, they're all socially interacting them. Cecil um, and, and all those, they're, they're all friends out, outside of the what's going on. Because um, you know, it is... That's really interesting because even though you know all these people know each other, when you, you watch or you read about things, you always kind of get this impression that they really didn't have much to do with each other. Yeah. 
you know, oh, they yeah. were kind of like skulking around each other or they just, because of their various other differences, they just didn't really interact unless they had to. So to hear that they were kind of like liaising on and having the sort of relationships that people do almost like now, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not now because of COVID, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. H have a look at a map and actually see how close Rushton Hall is to um, Birdie House or Belton House. And they're sort of short horse rides away from each other. Kirby Hall is another one um, uh, that that comes into the story as well. And that's only down the road. And they're all going from house to house. Um, interestingly as well, that a lot of these houses, James is actually in the time before um, the plot and, and after he takes the English throne, he's visiting all these people he's turning up at their house and, and using it as hunting lodges and, and all those sorts of things. So even, even James is, is acquainted with, with most of these people uh, and getting involved with all of them. So it, it's... It, the first video, you know, James, King James the first, essentially, despite essentially being a Protestant himself, he didn't really individually have an issue with letting the Catholics lead a more open life to the recusants, like sort of, you know, taking away the laws and the fines and everything like that. And I suppose to him, it would be politically advantageous to be not strongly one way or the other. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, but the, the key family to all of this, and, and again, if you have a look at the family tree, you'll see, uh, is the Vauxes of Harridan, um, the first Lord Vaux. Um, third Lord Vaux, sorry. The first Lord Vaux actually um, was um, a strong supporter of Margaret Beaufort. And Margaret Beaufort was his mentor. So and even that... Yeah, you, and that you, obviously you, going back quite, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, so you, you, we've already just talked about Catesby on one side and then you've got Margaret Beaufort's connection on the other side. So it's very small, tight community. Yeah, really narrow. All, all these people. Um, I think the first time really that we start to see um, these people coming together um, is the Poison Pommel affair. You put the teeth back in again. Um, <laughs> which is in 1596. Uh, and four people who were implicated in it uh, was Francis Tresham, Robert Catesby, John Wright, and his brother Christopher. And they're all involved in it. So that when we get to the gunpowder plot, yeah. you know, that these are already seasoned, treasonable people, for want of a better description. So what, uh, was, what, what was that plot exactly? And how did they manage to get away intact? <laughs> right. They, they were just arrested. Um, but it was quite possibly another one of Cecil's made up plots. Okay. So it, it might not have even been a, a real plot. But the idea was, was that somebody had put poison on the pommel of Elizabeth's saddle on her horse. Uh, and that would then go into her and, and kill her. Okay. Very far-fetched, but it's a possibility. The okay. next one we have is, is the Essex Rebellion. And that, of course, is absolutely nothing to do with Catholics, or anything else similar. However, as part of that plot, and very much involved in it, um, you've got um, Tresham is there as part of it. Catesby is part of it, and he actually even gets wounded during the, the fight that goes on as part of it. Wow. So, oh so that... Uh, you have to go and look up the story of the Essex Rebellion um, because it's quite a long story, but it's a very interesting one. But just the fact that they're all involved in it. And this, is... we spoke about this in the first video about how um, the Monteagle letter, um, you know, there's a, there's a fairly sort of, but you know, you were saying that there's, there seems to be a hint of Cecil about it. It could even have been a, a, a setup of Cecil. And now yes. it makes me think, you know, Cecil's there. He's, he's like a spy master. He knows what's going on all over Europe. He's putting all these things together. And the fact is that you, you, know, you are seeing these same names come up. And 
getting away with it for want of a better expression that that really makes me sort of think were they just all in it together was he was yeah. he pulling their strings the whole time like they had some sort of an arrangement and yes, they ended up like dying after the gunpowder plot, but you can only push your luck for so long. And for Cecil, they would have just been collateral damage. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the full list of those that were involved in, in the Essex plot, um, as we said, Robert Catesby, Thomas Winter, John and Christopher Wright, Thomas Percy, John Grant, Francis Tresham, even William Parker, Lord Mount Eagle, also takes part in the Essex Rebellion, which is... I just, I can't believe it. Yeah. So they're all there. They're, they're, we keep going back to it, but the, the gunpowder plotters were not just random people who suddenly yeah. got together. Yeah. Um, they're, they're all very much... All of them, as a consequence of it, were really heavily fined. They were all fined £8,000 each. Wow. In, by that money. Yeah. Which, I mean, which, that would be millions huge. today, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, Robert Catesby was actually in prison for a while. Um, Francis Tresham, he'd been left to guard the councillors when they kidnapped the councillors. Um, he only escaped a charge of treason by bribing Lady Catherine Howard a thousand pounds as a result of this. Um, some of the payments also were given to the Lord of the Tower, Thomas Howard, before they, he could actually get a pardon. So he, he's very much in, involved in all of this. And then to top it all off, um, because Catesby hadn't got that much money, it also appears that Thomas Tresham, Francis, his father, actually paid off Catesby's find as well. Wow. So That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but as I say, going back to Lord Vaux um, of Harrodon, this is William the Third Lord. Um, he's the only peer to actually be convicted of recency in the whole time. And he's extremely closely connected with Campion, the, the Jesuit priest, or the first Jesuit priest, um, who would come to Harridan Hall as his children's tutor. Mm. So this, this is showing you that close connection. Um, and it sounds horrific now, but after Campion was executed, uh, five, five years afterwards, certain pieces of Campion uh, found their way into the Vaux household mm. and they kept them there. It's, it's like something out of a horror movie that you're yeah. keeping bits under the bed. Um, yeah. Fright, frightening, isn't Why it? Would you, oh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, so I think, I, so, I, I think sometimes it's difficult. Oh, how come on words? You know how difficult things were for Catholics in that period because obviously a lot of people look at the Reformation and there's this all this big shift and people assume that it was you very often hear people say immediately oh it was Catholics and Protestants but it wasn't it was just reformed Catholicism so in yeah. fact there was but by this time of course there was a bigger divide because the time had gone by but despite all this time going by there was still a huge real divide, I think, between the, you know, Catholicism and Protestantism. I sometimes wonder, you know, with the recusants, I don't know if I've, I never know if I was going to say that properly, it doesn't want to come out. They were still quite sort of overt and seen as very staunch Catholics who weren't being told everything. But you wonder what percentage of people were actually Catholics, but who were just going along for the Protestant ride because it was just easier. Yeah. Yeah. You must also remember, and, and people very rarely talk about this side of it, but as the Catholics were being persecuted, so were the Puritans. Yes, yeah. Who were, who were obviously the extreme mm. Protestants. So they were getting not quite so much as a hiding, but they were suffering uh, at the same time. Um, it was fortunate that... Um, I suppose Elizabeth's leading churchman, um, Edmund Grindle, I think his name was, um, he was totally anti-Catholic and very pro-Puritan. And so the Puritans get away with a lot more because of that. In mm. fact, actually, Grindle ends up getting sacked from his job because he 
he supports the Puritans too much. So yes, so that's an interesting side. Now, going back to the story. Yes. <laughs> um, there's so many rabbit holes, there's so many rabbit holes. There is. Um, um, Vaux is put in prison. Um, his eldest son, Henry, um, who should be the, um, his heir, um, he gives it up to go and join the priesthood mm-hmm. and ends up going off to, um, to France to do it. So the whole thing passes to his second son, George. George then marries Eliza Roper, or Elizabeth Roper, and they have a son, Edward. George dies quite early, and um, Eliza seems to take control of all the Vaux lands, and her two stepdaughters, they all become incredibly wound up and and tight in this Catholic network. Um, Not just in Northampton, Northamptonshire, but the, the whole of England, and they're literally running it all from from Northamptonshire, all the Catholic priests, and they're all being supported. Um, and particularly, she's very much involved in it all. Um, and Eleanor, her sister, is, but not quite so much. Um, Tresham's, of course, is all involved in all of this as well. Um, and what's going on, particularly more he, more his father. Um, and as we been as we talked about in the in the previous one. Um, it seems very much like um, that James was going to be very, uh, I won't say particularly pro, but he wasn't anti-Catholic. Yeah. We say at, at that time. And it's then we start to see these whole series of new plots come up. The first one um, is literally just after James takes the throne um, and it's known as the Watson plot or sometimes as the treason of priests. Um, but more often than not, it's known as the by plot um, mm-hmm. because it's it's part of another plot. Uh, and this was the alleged conspiracy uh, by English courtiers to remove James and replace him with his cousin, the Arabella Stewart, which is where, where that appears from. Um, and the plot supposedly led by Henry Brook, Lord Cobham, who is also related to everybody else as well. <laughs> um, and this is the time then that Sir Walter Raleigh gets involved in it and ends up getting executed. Mm. Um, again, it does sound so much like it's all a put up job um, to make it happen and make things worse. Um, as we said, um, James then introduces, um, uh, reintroduces the recluse he finds and everything that goes with it. Um, but at the same time, while this is going on, you've got this undercurrent of Scottish nobles are being given English lands. And they're also being given money collected from the recluse fines, mm. which was supposedly to be given to the to the poor people of the counties where, where it's involved. Yeah. Um, which is why you get this poem come out. Um, hark, hark, the dogs do bark. The beggars have come to town, some in rags and some with jags, and one in a velvet gown. And of course... That's all the Scottish supporters, and the one in the velvet gown, of course, is James. James. So this is going on. So, and even when Guy Fawkes is initially tortured, he says the reason he was trying to blow up Parliament was because there were too many Scotsmen in it. So you can you can see all these connections and, and how they're all sort of running around. Uh, and taking part in all of it. Interesting, isn't it? It is, and it's, I don't know, it's one of the things, you, you look at it, if you look at Tudor history, just for example, which is obviously where I, I start from, and you see how all these interrelationships occur, you know, people marrying within families, or et cetera, et cetera, and everyone who's looked at this has known, and they're all called Thomas, and, you know, and that type of a thing, but you're still seeing this in the same families and the same lines, and the same divisions exactly you know like even from like the, sort of the late um medieval periods and you know you mentioned earlier about um margaret beaufort and william catesby and still all this time ahead so much has cracked off in the interim obviously yes. it's gone through a whole dynasty in the reformation and and you know regicides and all this type of thing 
and here we are and it's still almost the same undercurrent bubbling there with the same people you know on, on the same size even albeit for slightly different reasons it's almost like nothing's changed no it's just a uh, and, different set of things to be cross about yeah uh, and, and, and another one which again looking at why these people are sort of getting like this and why they're getting anti um and anti-protestant and why these people are feeling this for example um when the spanish armada comes all the catholics are all locked up and they're all thrown in in prison because of it because they think they're going to cause problems yeah. um for example i'm just trying to remember now they like these things are just so much um <laughs> I don't know how you remember it all uh vaux tresham and catesby are all locked up together at that point when the spanish armada takes place oh surely that was asking for trouble yeah so <laughs> you know you're gonna you're gonna and they've done nothing wrong at that time so you can understand why they get getting a bit hacked off with the system and the people uh and all those because of it so it, it creates issues. Um, William Catesby, um, he was tried in 1581 for mm. harboring the Jesuit Edmund Campion. There it is. Yeah. Ben. So you can see all this, all this background that's all building and it's all bubbling up to the surface. And I suppose really, by the time you get to the gunpowder plot it's that one big, big life bubble just as the whole thing boils yeah so people kind of when i say well yeah see it as an event in isolation that's not to say that you didn't know that there had been tensions bubbling and obviously this mm. sort of religious divide had been going on for a notable period but i suppose when you just look in at the sort of what we you know the essential story it, that it, it looks almost as simple as you know, there's a number of, you know, most Catholics have either converted happily or unhappily or accept the situation or know that they are taking risks because they are still observing mass, they're hiding priests. Um, some of them who can financially afford to flout it because they can afford to pay the fines for not attending the Protestant service. Yeah. So you know yeah. that there's still these tensions, but it almost seems like the gunpowder point is saying, well, you know, these Catholics finally got cross enough to go, we're not having this anymore. We're going to strike a big blow, knowing perhaps that some people were unhappy with having a Scot on the throne, maybe, mm. rightly or wrongly. And, and, you know, that sort of, they felt a little bit braver to take a bigger step than they maybe would have done while Elizabeth was still alive. Yeah. But actually, it, it's all, as you said, that when, once you say it like that, it is almost like the champagne of plots has all been shaken up and at that point the corks finally the pop cork goes. All these people that you've seen occur again and again and again in all these situations mm. are all dead now. <laughs> one yeah. way or the other or most of them as a result uh, you know uh, uh, dying of all this well we talked in the other video about what they all died of and how they all died the plotters and some of the associates that came with them right to the last stand um you know, it didn't end well for any of them, basically, no. one way or another. No. But then what comes after that? All those people that you, you've talked about, they're all dead. So then what happens? Yeah. Nothing yeah. much, really. No. I mean, there, there, are, there are still a lot of Catholic families around, um, and they do seem to have gone very underground at that point because they just dared not show their faces. Yeah, well... It, we said as well previously the irony is that because of Catesby's dream if it was Catesby's dream you could even go as far as to say that but was mm -hmm. you know that they wanted to you know basically make England you know Catholic again yeah you know to go back to what what Mary the first had tried to start and basically what Henry the, the England that they had before Henry instigated if you want to say it was him that instigated the Reformation you know what I mean yeah, um, yeah. but it's it, it really and I suppose they thought they really hoped that James would give them about as good as it was going to get yes and that didn't exactly pan out for various reasons but what happened in the end achieved the opposite of what 
it was intended to do and more. Oh Please yeah, it, it was like a huge deal shut up. It was yeah. a miserable, dangerous, depressing place to be. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and also obviously you then start to get James on his witch hunting mm. crusade and that starts as well. Um, to use the, the modern or the modern-ish parlance, he's looking for reds under the bed constantly and, and looking who's out to get him. Uh, which um, is horrific. I mean, I suppose there'd been so many, the line of the Stuart Kings, you know, the other Jameses and things, it, you know, yeah. generally things hadn't gone well for them. So I guess you could understand that he was a bit paranoid because people he'd had other attempts made on his life Pretty yes. more specifically like somebody individually trying to go for him rather than exploding the whole of the establishment yeah yeah so uh, he was no it. stranger to having to think that that you know was a, was a constant thing that he needed to look for yeah and if i can just go back to, to another example of, of catesby being involved things um because we had um father gerard who was taken prisoner Yes, uh, yes, and he was being tortured in the, in the tower. Um, in October uh, 1597, he manages to escape by stringing a rope across from the tower, um, across the moat, to the outside to escape. And where does he go? He goes to Robert Catesby, who was waiting for him at Uxbridge. That's 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 the stuff of of a major blockbuster film. That is, isn't it? It is. Yeah. If it's done, if they do it properly and accurately. Yeah, that's um, impressive. You deserve to keep your life if you manage to do that. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then after that, they actually go to Harridan Hall to the waltzes, which, it, which again is showing, and, and in fact, Gerard does set up his headquarters uh, at Harridan Hall and the, the other places around it. Um, so if the population of... Well, I'm going to say the UK. I think the population of the UK is in the region of 70 million people now, isn't it? Yeah. But what it is for England, I couldn't say, actually. But in terms of the size of population, this is a really like, you're probably going to either look at me and go, I know that, or look at me and go, how am I meant to know that? What was the population, do you think, round about that sort of time, you know, early 17th century? I'm, I'm going to go with the second answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> that is perfectly <laughs> fine, because I don't know why anybody would know that unless they had really specifically had to do a piece of research on it. Yes. But certainly cities that are now populated by hundreds of thousands of people were populated by thousands of people. Yes. Yeah. So I suppose the nobility, gentry, royal circle, however you want to term it, was a very narrow field of people. Oh yeah. And they, yeah. you know, and the proles in the street knew nothing of what was cracking off most of the time. No, no, they were just merrily going on their own way and doing their own thing. And the only time you got involved was when people started doing propaganda leaflets and slinging them about and, and trying to convert people. But of course, they try to convert the nobility, not the ordinary people in the street as a whole, or the nobility in the gentry, should I say? Mm. Uh, which okay. makes some really Pro propaganda yeah. of, of the underclasses is a whole other issue. <laughs> oh, it is. We could do about ten talks on that and not get to the bottom of it. Yeah, and you know, it's one of those things that history sees repeatedly, and but doesn't seem to change no because they don't have historians in high places in councils and governments this this is clearly what's missing yeah, yeah. what is it yeah. people who study history are doomed to watch others repeat it exactly <laughs> yes. and we certainly do that we do right <laughs> is there anything else um that i haven't thought to ask you or that you think we should um, no. it comes in nicely with this or have we cut it all together quite nice now all these juicy extra bits it. that yeah. are excellent uh, yeah i think we, i think we got it all but it, it shows the importance of all these this group of families it's just incredible and i i with this sort of knowledge you know i've, I've read about it and i know a bit about it and i also read um you know, peter Ackroyd's series of books yes yeah so which are good this one civil war 
um, History of England. These are really good, actually. If people haven't read them, the Tudor one is particularly good, which is the second volume. Yep. So obviously I've read about it in there because the second one, the Tudor one, basically finishes at, at Elizabeth's death. So obviously it comes and it's called Civil War, but obviously you sort of go through that period. And that sort of talks about it in quite a lot of depth, but I wasn't expecting to get as much juicy depth as this. So thank you so <laughs> much for that. It's been really, really good. It's been excellent. I hope everybody My will enjoy it. My pleasure as always. Um, so I'm sure I will see you again soon anyway, either in person or on a screen, but whatever it is we do next. So I hope everyone has enjoyed this. Um, I will put some information underneath a bit more about where you can find Mike and the other conversations that we've had. And also he talks about a family tree as well. So I'll make sure everybody knows how to access that. But in the meantime, Mike, thank you so much. And I will speak to you soon. Thank you. Talk to you Take soon. Care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.